So Modpo people have struggled with the way. And I'd like for a few minutes to talk about that struggle in anticipation for the later chapters of the course. I, we could spend the rest of the, of the webcast on this, and I don't want to. I don't want to, but I do want to address the issue generally. So let's just throw out on the table what are the difficulties, what are the issues that Modpo people face when they go from these other poems to the way and if the way stands in a, down at the end of a long line of Dickinsonianism, what does it mean? So what are some of the problems? Would you just throw out a one word or a one phrase answer to one of the problems? Lack of um, obvious connections from line to line in the way that even though we, it looks visually like a Niedeker poem, it makes much more radical jumps. Right. So visually, it looks like a Niedeker poem, but stanza to stanza, we break. It, I think the word we might use is discontinuity. Right. It's non-narrative and discontinuous. And even the subject seems discontinuous. So though um, John O'Connor and others on the uh, forums, I've been really engaging with this issue personally, and there's been a back and forth. Some people say, how could we possibly know this is not her eye speaking? So, Eric, did you want to comment on that? You look like you do want to comment. Let's get, let's get Eric. One thing I would say to her, sure. One thing I would say to help people who are thinking about this is if you've read The Wasteland, you know that you're constantly shifting scenes. I mean, Elliot is almost like a dramatist. What's happening here is a much more compact version of that. She's bringing you into a, a series of different scenes where the person speaking and the place you're looking at are slightly different. But if we, if we think about this almost like a, a member of an audience watching a drama, we know that we could be seeing different moments from that history brought together. Right. Okay? Right. And then as you reflect on it, you're going to eventually get a sense hopefully, mm -hmm. of where you might be. And also, you're going to be questioning a lot. And obviously, right. questioning that process right. as a reader is very important. So that's very helpful. I want to just generalize about it. Maybe we'll actually take a few other comments on what we're facing, and then we'll drop it and pick it up in a later week. Um, so, so far, discontinuity. And then Eric adds, if I may use just the word, voices. So what's happening is that Ray Armentrout is picking up different voices. And instead of using a lyric I poem as a, this is what I feel, this is what I think, and the consistent thing is the I that thinks and feels all these things, she is presenting to us patches of a world, parts of a world, voices of a world. And then, in the end, she either gets to herself, the, as a child I was abandoned, it has such a memoiristic sense about it, or it's yet another I that's not her, but it doesn't matter. So the point is that we go from poems, even, you know, Corman, certainly, Niedeker, where there is a consistent subject that's reporting, although modernistically still reporting on the world. Ray Armentrout is a postmodern poet, and she's not reporting on the world from a single subjectivity. She's reporting on the world from the many voices she overhears. And this is troubling because we don't know how to read someone who speaks in many voices until, as Eric suggests, we use devices like imagine you're at a play and several characters are speaking the poem. What I want to do is go around and ask for very brief um, advice, warnings and advice to Modpo people who are not really fastening their seatbelts yet. Because when we get to Gertrude Stein and then we pick up in chapter 7, uh, sorry, chapters 8 and 9, we're going to be getting dealing with poems a lot like this all the time. So if you're worried and nervous now about the decentering of the eye, whoa, watch out. So, Julia, a word to the wise? Well, I'm going to take a cue from Erica Kaufman, who's joining us on Twitter also. Erica Kaufman, the poet? Erica Kaufman, the poet and associate director of the Institute for Writing and Thinking at, at Bard, Bard College. College. Erica, hello. We admire Erica. Um, and she writes, so she's telling us how to do this? She says, we're on the way. Talk about line breaks, which I think is so true for, for Ray Armentrout's poem. So, you know, you what, what, what does she mean? That was very Twitter-like. I mean, it's it's enigmatic, yeah, <laughs> like she's, all she's Twitter. Enigmatic. What do you think she means? <laughs> I mean, Erica, you should post again to tell me more what you mean if you're listening. But um, when I look at the way, 
I think, well, one way into the poem is is to look at those line breaks and just remember all the kinds of work a line break can do. It can limit us to, to one chunk of thought um, and kind of let go of our expectations of continuity and single voice and, you know, and especially um, and and just the ways in which the line break can really can really propel you forward while also holding you in, mm, in one interesting moment. Interesting observation. That's great. Erica, I'm going to tell you if you can call this hour, please do, 215-573-9752, because we'd like to talk to you, Erica. Emily, throw out a word to the wise to warn our Modpo people about why this is sort of the thing, this is the way, as it were, it's going to happen, and, it, and why is it okay with you? Um, I think, you know, I noticed on the forum some, some fears about this type of difficult poetry and particularly how that constructs the role of the reader and the word get overreading, which is a word that we responded to before, gets thrown around a lot. And I think what overreading means for people who've been schooled on a lot of traditional poetry is they feel that they're doing too much work, essentially, that they're doing so much work in parsing meaning and significance that they must be doing something wrong. But because there are so many fewer narrative cues and as the eye is decentered, these poems demand a lot more work. And when you remember that, it feels a lot less like overreading and a lot more like doing what the poem is requiring of you. And that was helpful for me. To Very try nice. Understand. Dave, quickly. When you go to a hockey game and you sit in the first row right up against the glass, you can still follow the action if it's slow. But once it gets fast, once you're in playoff hockey mode, you cannot take it all in. You're watching the puck, and then you're watching the defenseman battle it out, and then you're watching uh, a whole bunch of things all over the ice. And you just sometimes get a better view if you go a few rows up, maybe even to the next section, and you take it all in as a whole. So don't worry about not being able to follow a single narrative. Sometimes just back up and take it in as a whole. If we back up, Amaris, you're next. If we yeah. back up away from the way and try not to solve its riddles, what are we seeing? What, what is this poem achieving? What is its point? What is it doing? Can you try that? Um, I see it less as an object to attack and piece apart. Um, I think within any moment in time, all of us are dealing with multiple voices and memories that are coming into play, and it's even difficult ourselves to focus it on one conversation and one flow of thought. So in that way, her poem, which is an assembly of found items, is just a reflection of all those various accumulations. So in reflecting our own thought processes back to us, I feel like she's just telling us to accept that chaos and to be calm with it. Accept the chaos and be calm with it. That was such a good word that I think I will say one thing and then we'll go to the phone and we'll, we'll drop the way for now and this whole problem. But I just want to say one more thing about the way. I love this. I really do love this poem. I know that my, my discussion forum friends, I've been very modest about supporting it, but now I'm in trouble. So I'm going to go home at, you know, 11 o'clock or something and I'm going to go into the forums. They're all going to say, ah, Al, you came out of the closet. You really like this poem. Um, here's what moves me about this poem. By the end, we get what might be the memoiristic feeling of the poet, or we might be just getting something else that she's reporting from her world. But what we get is an I that seems persuasive. <clears throat> As a child, I was abandoned in a story made of trees. As a child, I was left like Gretel in the woods. And the story is made of trees. I mean, when I first learned how to read, the storybook that I was reading, and in which I got lost as a young reader, the portrait of the young poet as a young reader, really, the portrait of the girl as a young poet being read to by her mom and getting lost in a book made of trees, paper. Here, here's the small gasp. Here, 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 this. Right here, here, in this poem, right here, in this poem where we, as Amaris points out, are already lost. We don't know where the hell we are or who the I is. We're lost in a poem made of trees. And she is saying that when I was a child, I got lost. And that's the achievement. It's not a bad thing to get lost 
in your reading when you're a child. It's that moment when parents walk out of the room and they celebrate. I used to have to read to this kid, and now this kid's got her nose in a book. And this is the beginning of the imagination. This is the beginning of the human being, the adult human being with imagination, lost in a poem, lost here. And when she gets inside the reading experience, so deep the world doesn't exist, it's only the book. We've all had this, right? She comes upon a clearing here, here in this poem, here at the end of the way. She finds the way, Gretel does, the lost little Ray. She finds the way, she comes to the clearing, and the clearing is come upon, which is a storybook word, upon, once upon a way, once upon a time, there was a path through a wood, right? Comes upon, and then again in quotes, and that's the end of the poem. Once again, the reading experience has delivered her down the path, along the way, to a place where she's lost, and that lost is thrilling, that lostness is thrilling. We have no idea who the subject is or where she is, and we are lost, and that's exactly why the poem enacts formally what it's telling us about the reading experience. Hot shit, that's a great poem, because it reenacts the girl who became the poet. She's really remembering why she became the poet that she becomes. Terrific.